It's time for another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas, the podcast covering the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life in general here in the Ozarks. Whether you are considering a move to this area or trying to learn more about the place you call home, we've got something special for you. Without further ado, here's our fearless host, Randy Wilbur. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn. I'm excited to be with you today. I have a great guest. One is that is going to, hopefully by the end of this episode, you are going to be hungry and you're going to want to check out some of the places that she's going to talk about on this particular episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I have Chef Aaron Rowe on the show today. And uh, Chef Aaron is has, she has two things that she's done in our area. One is she has the Ozark Culinary Tours, which she provides tours to some of the best eating destinations in Northwest Arkansas, specifically Bentonville and Rogers, but she's also covering Springdale and Fayetteville. So I really want to encourage you to check out the culinary tours, and we're going to talk more about that. We'll make sure there's some information in the show notes. And then um, the second thing she's done is she's written a book because, you know, you know, a tour is one thing, but a book is something else and a book lasts a lifetime. And so she has a book on Ozark culinary history. And so for somebody like me, I've only been here five plus years. I'm still learning things. So just like you guys, I hope to learn something new today from this particular episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. So without further ado, I want to welcome Chef Aaron Rowe to the show. How are you doing? I'm great, Randy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's I hope you like that. Here. Yeah, I hope you like that introduction. I just wanted to build you up. So we're I excited. Yeah, Thank we're excited you. to have you on the podcast. So I would love the way that we start this podcast out is that we always ask our guests, please share your superhero origin story. So mm -hmm. I would love for you just to share a little bit about who Chef Aaron Rowe is. Gotcha. I love it. Well, um, I I didn't always have the cape and golden lasso. I just kind of grew up in little old Salem Springs, Arkansas. Okay. Uh, I didn't really know how to cook when I was growing up. And I, you know, my mom was a Kansas farm girl, but a lot of times, you know, how kids sort of sneak off in, in the high school and go to a party. I was sneaking into the kitchen to learn how to cook after my mom went to bed. So I taught myself how to cook by going through like painstakingly through the pages of the joy of cooking <laughs> and fell in love with the cooking world, you know, sort of like the Julia and Julia story that you've seen, maybe the movie or the book with Meryl Streep. It's a very you know, good movie. Yeah, it's so good. You know, <laughs> cooking from basically cover to cover and, you know, making a bunch of mistakes along the way, but sort of bouncing back and that being my formal education. By the time I went away to culinary school in Maui, they were like, we're going to be ready to have you go ahead and skip all the way to the advanced courses. How do you know all this stuff already? And I was like, I just, you know, was interested, started learning. I went away to Maui um, just to uh, sell fine art originally, um, right after college, you know, and that sort of thing. And I found that I could pay off my student loans selling art on commission. But the best thing about selling art was when I would sell a painting or a portrait or a piece of photography or sculpture, I would take myself out to dinner. And Maui has a plethora of really elegant and um, gourmet restaurants that we really didn't have in Northwest Arkansas. Until, you know, recently, once I came back from Maui, you know, after Crystal Bridges, after a lot of those changes from 2010 or 11 on. And so for me, Maui was this formative experience in great food, not just uh, that I could eat at a restaurant. And I thought, you know, if I ever go back to school, I will go to the Maui Culinary Academy. So, you know, a couple of years later, I went back and I put myself through culinary school, did all that, wrote for a magazine out there called Maui No Cut Oi Magazine which was food writing at its best, doing restaurant reviews. And then basically when I came back to Northwest Arkansas, I noticed that nobody was writing down the story of our food history here in the, here in the Ozarks. So I uh, pitched myself to a publisher. They bought it, took line and sinker, sent me a contract. And I began work on a book that took about a year and a half of my life, researching, writing, interviewing people like you're doing with me today, hundreds of farmers, cooks, gourmet chefs, everybody that covers the whole food scene in Northwest Arkansas. And writing that book down, I had in my back of my mind, I wanted to do an Ozark food tour, but I knew that I could only do one or the other to give it full credence. So I went ahead and focused on the book, put the food tour on the back burner, 
by the time the book is launched and I've been doing lectures on it and talks for it for about a year after it launched, I think that's 2017. Then I was like, all right, time for the food tour. Let's make the food we have here in Northwest Arkansas come alive, not just to the locals, but the tourists. Oh, I love that. So I guess my first question, since you you bring up the book and also you mentioned the tours, let's start with the book. What was your biggest takeaway about the the culinary representation of the Ozarks? If you had to say your biggest aha moment and your research and everything that you looked at and all of the people that you interviewed, what was your biggest aha moment about the, the unique culinary aspects of the Ozarks? I think my biggest aha moment I had in the Rogers Museum, sifting through hundreds and hundreds of photographs, Randy, that they had in old shoe boxes and like file folders. I just wanted to document the food history through the pictures that I could find, almost like a pictorial representation of these old black and whites. And I would say about 75% of them were hunting and fishing pictures, which to me told me, wow, the Ozarks is really fundamentally at its core a place of hunting and fishing. And that's what makes up our food story. That's the core of the book. For me, there's a lot of things in there. There's canning, pickling, corn, has its own chapter, apples do as well. But what 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 is the heartbeat behind Ozark food and the research I did? It has to be whatever's mostly photographed. And it was pictures of, of guys and gals fishing, catching squirrel, rabbit, possum, hanging them from a gun, people out hunting, trapping, that sort of thing. That's our rich culinary heritage. And then when I interviewed hunters and fishermen, my biggest takeaway further was that they are the ones that care about con- conservation more than anyone else. They get a bad rap sometimes. People assume, oh, yeah, these guys are out hunting down the whitetail. Well, they're doing that to help cut down the population so it's sustainable and they don't get the wasting disease like we have right now in the Buffalo River from the elk. Because there has to be some kind of controlling of the population. Hunters and fishermen have been doing it in the Ozarks since before we had a Game and Fish Commission. And I'm really grateful that they continue to do that now to help save our food heritage in such a big way. So that was my, my, my biggest aha or surprise moment. Wow. Okay. So in, in, in compiling this, how many, how many, do you know offhand how many recipes you ended up categorizing in this, uh, in this book? Well, it's funny you ask that because the book is literally one quarter of my research. (laughs) Three quarters of it didn't fit into the page requirements. So if you want to talk about what all is that I categorize and research outside of the book and then what came into it, about 50 heirloom recipes that mostly were orally passed down got published in the book. But as far as the recipes I gathered, probably over 400. Wow. Is what I found in this research. And how many of those recipes... How many of those recipes have you tried yourself? Um, probably about 95%. And the other 5% that I couldn't get a hold of, like, let's say, raccoon and sweet potatoes. I just went ahead and trusted a, a veritable source. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm not a big person on eating the idea of eating raccoon. Right, I can eat right. squirrel and I can do that. And I've definitely made those. But as far as like um, some of the recipes I have in there, I know they're good recipes. I'm just not necessarily crazy about raccoon myself, but it is part of our heritage. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so I had well, to put it in there, you know. It's funny you mentioned rabbit. I actually just um, interviewed the um, p- current president and CEO of Pelfries based in Rogers. Are you familiar with them? Oh, nice. Yeah. Are you, are you familiar with Don't that company? Don't they do chicken or they do chicken no, and rabbit? No, they're all rabbit. Sorry? Yeah, they're all rabbit. All rabbit. Awesome. Yes. And okay. Pelfries is Perfect. probably one of the largest suppliers of rabbits in the country. And uh, Brian Bonk is the president and CEO over there. And uh, he has a really good story about Pelfries because it's it not only is it the rabbit for eating, but they also use it for biological purposes and research. So oh. it's kind of a twofold process. Their goal is to make rabbits as widely available as possible for consumption, but then also for they have a whole biological research portion of it as well so that there is no waste whatsoever with the animals. So uh, I thought it was kind of interesting. And and they, he's actually partnered, partnered up with local restaurants um, to do some really interesting um, 
food pairings with rabbits, including like a rabbit barbacoa and some other stuff that I just thought was really cool. So he's done some things in downtown Rogers, as well as with, I believe, Yayo's and um, some other Mm -hmm. really great restaurants in the area. So that's um, it's interesting to hear you mention rabbits because that's become more synonymous here in Northwest Arkansas lately than it was previously. So. Absolutely. That's fantastic. I love the fact that we're bringing in that wild game element into our restaurants. I know the first time I went to press room when they reopened off the Bentonville square, I had a rabbit terrine and it was fantastic. Yeah. No. Press- barbacoa. When you said barbacoa, I immediately thought it's gotta be <laughs> Yeyos and Rafael Rios. He's a genius. He is a genius. <laughs> yeah, no, they, those guys know <laughs> what they're doing. So, so tell me, um, what what once you did this book, what was the initial reaction you got from people locally? A lot of people felt like, oh my goodness, this is my grandma's recipe. I had so many people that read the book. You know, at first I was selling them at the little arts and craft festivals we have here. So they were, you know, rifling through the book to see, oh right, well, let me see if there's a legit book. Do you have biscuits and chocolate gravy? Do you have this really good cornbread without any sugar in it? You know, do you have refrigerator pickles? And a lot of people that went through the recipe books, one lady, I just remember specifically teared up and said, this is the recipe I've been looking for for my grandma since she passed away because she wrote things down on scraps of paper. And of course, like all recipes, people lose them. She's like, thank you for documenting her recipe. And I know that it's not just her recipe. It's a recipe of many grandmothers and many women that cooked without writing things down. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, because if we don't write it down, it sort of disappears when the people pass. Yeah. And so I think for me, a lot of people were were very encouraging in looking through the book because it was it brought back a sense of nostalgia and sense of place. Yeah. Now, for the folks that aren't from here, they're looking at the cover going, um, squirrel meatloaf. Is that like a normal thing you <laughs> guys eat around here? Because <laughs> right, right. that's yeah. in the subtitle. And um, and I was like, no, it's just, it's the 2014 world championship winner. My publishers went wild about it. There are normal recipes in there and not just unusual, you know, cage-free, antibiotic-free, healthy, uh, healthy meat sources. You know, I mean, there's, you can still find a good recipe in there for um, like a duck or a, tra- a smoked trout. It's not all just got to be some crazy foods that you normally wouldn't catch out in your yard. You know? Right. Well, and I love that because you said something that I think a lot of people listening to this would resonate with, and that is food has a way to transport us to time and place. So for me, like when you were saying that, I think about all the dishes that my grandmother made, and I had a great aunt Ada that could burn, as they say, in the kitchen, and everything that she made was just simply divine. But I remember like there were only two recipes of hers that I actually have. And one is her coleslaw. The other are her chocolate chip cookies. And they were orally given to me. And then I wrote them down and my wife still has it. When we, when I was courting my wife, and I know that's an old fashioned word, but, yeah, but, but over 20 years ago, when I was courting my wife, before we got married, I took her to Pittsburgh to visit some family and my aunt showed her how to make that and she wrote it down and she still has the handwritten recipe Aww. and in and, and her Martha Stewart recipe cookbook. But um, but you're absolutely right, because every time she and she's she's nailed it with both the coleslaw and the and the chocolate chip cookies. And every time that she makes it, it just transports me back to a child going to visit Pittsburgh, sitting mm-hmm. at my aunt Ada's yep. table, enjoying that coleslaw. And there was just something about the creaminess of the coleslaw and the freshness of the chopped cabbage and the carrots that just took you to a whole nother place. Mm-hmm. And then to, I know. And then, and then at the <laughs> end of it to uh, enjoy those chocolate chip cookies, which which were, they were also amazing. It just, it's, there's something about that. So I'm glad that you were able to kind of restore the memory of a lot of people that probably grew up, but didn't take the time to maybe memorialize some of those special family heirloom recipes. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I remember one of my favorite recipes to record was, uh, my friend Gail, I spent about four hours in her kitchen drinking sweet tea, ultimately with moonshine. (laughs) <laughs> while she made her homemade cornbread and she had never measured it. She just knows. And I had to keep stopping her along the way. But once you get that cornbread cooking in the oven, 
she's like, this brings back memories working on the farm, you know? And I remember at the end of writing the book, I'd researched, I mean, spent so much time interviewing her. She made me a whole farm table dinner and it, literally the table buckled under the weight of all the plates. <laughs> and it was fantastic, you know? And so, and she said, that's the way we used to eat growing up. That was just normal. I mean, you wouldn't just have a meat in three sides or something. You're going to have pie and you're going to have pickles and you're going to have, like you said, like kind of this coleslaw or maybe some um, chow chow yeah. of grandma, oh, yeah, some kind absolutely. of like pickle relic, you know, yeah, yeah. that kind no. of stuff. And everything goes together flavor wise. It's good. You know, yeah. the fried chicken doesn't even, what do they say? It's what's good, hot, cold, or three days old fried chicken. Yes. Like it doesn't have to be hot up right out of the, out of the skillet. It can be, I like fried chicken room temperature with all that stuff. It reminds me of these old kind of socials or church dinners and stuff like right. that. <laughs> no, I love that. That is, that is good. And you're absolutely right. I love the sweet tea with moonshine. That, that, um, <laughs> the so kind good. of thing where, you know, where if it's sweet enough, it almost masks the Everclear or whatever they're using and you almost don't notice it until it's too late. So you know. Oh yeah, that's how it is with moonshine. You want to get a, you want to sit a spell if you're gonna have some moonshine, sweet tea. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Put the keys away. There is no driving involved. <laughs> you're, you're, you're just gonna spend some time on the on a back porch somewhere, telling some stories. So that's right. Uh, yeah. I think that was my favorite part about writing the book is just learning people's stories. I I, I met so many wonderful people and heard their stories of their families and. Uh, I've even got a couple sad stories in the book. I was going to say, if you wanted me to read a sad story with a, where food has a memory, I'd, I'd be happy to read it for you. But I don't know. It might be only, maybe we want to keep it only positive. Yeah. But, well, um, but no, yeah, I, I feel, you know, that, that is, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I would love for you to share a story that kind of in your mind, any one story that you can think of that would just kind of give our audience a, just a taste of, of what is included in your book and you know what yeah i'd love for you to do that okay all right cool it's in the apple or in the canning and pickling chapter okay it could be in the apple chapter it could go either way but it's a really meaningful story from 1926 so um here here goes <laughs> all right i never open a jar of apple jelly that is clear and red and beautiful that i don't think of my husband even though it's been over 45 years since his death on that Thanksgiving morning, we had just finished breakfast. The family had eaten up the last of a jar of apple jelly. And my husband was sitting at the breakfast table holding our baby. We called him CC. And he started pestering me to open up another jar of apple jelly. And I told him I wasn't going to do it because there's just one jar left. And if I opened it, there wouldn't be any left for Christmas. He kept on and on to pestering. And finally, he started bouncing CC on his knee saying, CC, tell your mama that she'll have apple jelly for the rest of her life. But she may not always have you and me. And I told them they were trying to play on my sympathies, and I didn't have a bit of sympathy for either one of them. But I got busy, and I fixed them up to more hot biscuits and opened that jar of apple jelly. And I can still see them sitting there enjoying it, the way that baby's face looked so happy over that apple jelly. And right after that, the tornado came and took them away from me that very day. And I have been so glad that the rest of my life, I haven't had to live knowing that I hadn't opened that, art, that jar of apple jelly. Oh man, I love that. So yeah, sometimes that, um, you know, you, I think now more, more so than ever before, you want to cherish the time that you have with others. And I, that story is a perfect illustration mm -hmm. of that. Um, especially with what we're dealing with as we're recording this, we're still dealing with the pandemic and there's just a lot of challenges that we're going Absolutely. through. And I, I mean, that, that story captures the very essence of that. And, uh, I appreciate you sharing that, that, that recipe is in the book for the apple jelly. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a recipe for out thirty uh, pint jars. So. Okay, all right, <laughs> you can well, cool. Make it up and make it for Christmas for everybody. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm glad you mentioned that. What what specific town was this person in? By, just out of curiosity, that was out in Heber Springs. Okay, Heber Springs. Yeah, I know that. Uh, and we've had several other people, like Black Apple Cider, and a couple of other. Um, people on the podcast that have talked about the fact that what people don't realize that are new to this area in Northwest Arkansas is that there used to be a huge amount of apple orchards throughout Arkansas. Did, did, so Absolutely. in addition to this apple jelly recipe, did, did, did some of those apple orchards uh, inform some of your other recipes in the book by any chance? Oh, sure. Actually, I have a really good recipe for apple cider vinegar in here because, Ooh. you know, Arkansas used to 
grow most of the nation's apples from the 1890s to the 1920s, which is why these railroad tracks run through the middle of Springdale, Lincoln, up to the, right up to Frisco Station is there because of Rogers shipping off apples. But I've got a whole chapter on apples in here. And uh, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a great recipe, very simple for apple cider vinegar, which you just use the peels. And people use to all the time. Yeah. Um, and I'm from Tylem Springs and we had an apple cider vinegar, vinegar processing plant. And of course, you probably know that right downtown Springdale, where Black Apple Crossing is with Leo and the boys, you yep. know that there's yep. there's an apple processing center right there in Springdale that it used to be. I've got a good recipe for apple butter. Oh, um, and that makes about 32 pints for Christmas. Now, if you can get a big copper kettle to do it in, that's even better. because That's the that's the way you want to do it. And then um, other things that are from these apple days. Well, I went out to Cane Hill, Arkansas, which is our, our it's our old, earliest settlement the site of our first college and the first woman graduate kind of fun. Okay. And the, the little old ladies out there that met me for lunch, they gave me their apple spice cake with black walnut frosting recipe. Cool. Pretty sure that goes back to the early 1900s. And you have to broil the walnut frosting under the broiler for a sec. And uh, even stacked apple cake. People used to make that. It's like pancake thin layers of cake, maybe 10 or 20 layers up and you stick apples and applesauce between each layer and then you cut into it and so those are some old-fashioned recipes that definitely are from that earlier time man i you know i keep saying as i hear more and more about apples in this area i I, i'm hoping that we can get more apple orchards coming from new england uh i'm not from there but that's where i last lived before i moved here and apple picking obviously this time of year in the fall is very big and you know going to get cider and apple cider donuts, which are amazing. Oh, I, I mean, that, that you have one for me, we can pass oh, it the screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> but no, I just think that, um, I, you know, I know Leo has talked about that and they're trying to help see a resurgence of uh, apple orchards. And uh, they, they have a real big mission behind Black Apple. Uh, part of their just the cidery is them being able to encourage more uh, of a proliferation of apple orchards in this area to kind of resurrect what used to be. Because if you're not from here, mm-hmm. then you have no recollection of that. And you don't think or you don't it's not a natural thing. When I first heard about it, I was like, there were no apple orchards in Arkansas. But yeah, it's 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 absolutely a big deal. It's the same way with like when I tell people that um Arkansas is the largest producer of rice in the world. And people are like, yeah. what? And really? they have no idea. Yeah. And I'm <laughs> like, yeah, the whole downside downstate area is just yep. one big rice field. And um, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we export a lot of rice all over the world and it comes oh, from absolutely. the natural state. So, but uh, wow. I'm sure you've got stories for days. <laughs> from this book oh four so, days yes yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah, it's, absolutely. it's amazing how much yeah. i had to trim down yeah i remember when i was down the book randy i was literally crying as i took out about three quarters of my research oh my so goodness. you know i put it in file folder but i was like oh there's so many stories i want to tell when i meet people and they're like well here you should have interviewed me i'm like well i'll interview you for the next book because yeah. you've got some great stories too it's funny how many stories come about as a result of food yeah. You know, and like you were saying with the apple orchards everywhere, part of the reason we don't see them anymore is because people had to make money. So down with the apple orchards, up went the chicken houses. And right. so those are right over the pre-existing, you know, apple orchards that used to came to be. It's going to take us a while to bring it back because it takes about 12 years to grow a successful apple tree. Right. So, so yeah, yeah. But I but, love the effort. You know? Yeah. And I think it's necessary. And I think it's something we should definitely consider doing and, and being more proactive about it. So uh, mm-hmm. I would encourage anybody plant an apple tree, but um, yeah. also support anybody that's um, trying to grow at a larger scale apples in any area that you're in in Northwest Arkansas. So, mm-hmm. uh, so now tell me um, after the book, and 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 now you have this Ozark culinary tour. How how did you kind of merge the two or or do the two kind of cross paths? Well, I think I used my brand that I built around the book to then promote a tour. Because by that time I'd already had a pretty big social media following on Facebook and Instagram to go ahead and continue on that title. So that's why the book title and the tour title are very similar. It just kind of makes sense. 
Mm-hmm. Plus, Ozark is such a big like buzzword right now because of the Ozark show and all yeah. the other Ozark things. So I'm glad that we went with that instead of, you know, um, something something different. I think my publisher had originally pro- uh, suggested Ozark Mountains. But I was like, yeah. well, not everybody that lives in the Ozarks lives in the mountains themselves, you know. But right. at the end of the day, the tour, um, I think it reflects well the heritage of the book, but it takes what we're doing in the Northwest Arkansas and the Ozarks and expands it to the current date. So I wrote about the history and I talk about the history when I do a tour. So I'm, I'm your guide and I'll talk about the arts history and culture of the area and the food. And so I will dabble the information I researched in the book. It'll come into the tour at some point in my talks as we're going between buildings. Like, hey, this building used to be on the site where where Kaya Chocolate is, for example, on the Bentonville Square. The owner of that, previous to Kaya, many, many years back, owned our only movie theater in town. And he got all the money he made from growing wild strawberries, which used to be a big thing in Arkansas. And he used that money to build the theater. And you can still see a ghost sign of a neon old ghost sign with the strawberries falling out of a basket. If you look real closely at the building. So I'll talk, I'll intertwine that history into my tour. And I also talk about the future of our cuisine, the last chapter of my book, which that's what we embrace on tour because we're not just eating biscuits and gravy and <laughs> fried chicken. We're eating, we might be eating um, yayos, tacos, having some wonderful things in downtown Rogers at the Cuban restaurant, or we might be swinging by, um, you know, in Bentonville, we might go by Tavola Trattoria and have some wonderful Italian. So that's the new Ozark cuisine that's evolved. And, and I like to give kind of credence or, or a little bit of street cred to that, because as we go along as travelers, we can't always just rely on only Ozark foods because not every restaurant serves it. But yeah. I, I do like to kind of give, um, I do like to talk about that as well. So I, I intertwine both. They kind of interweave together. And I think that's important. It is. And, you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's kind of marrying the two. And it's the way I explain it to all my um, high minded friends on both coasts when they talk about why are you living in northwest Arkansas? And I'm like, you don't understand. And I start off <laughs> my conversations with Crystal Bridges and then I end with all of the amazing restaurants that make up this area. I mean, when I think of the preacher's son, um, uh, Matt Cooper, who we've had on the show, I think of the folks at Rope Swing, which Preacher Son is part of that restaurant group, cool. and um, you know the the folks at Rope Swing, and I just think of all the great restaurants. I mentioned Yayos. Mm-hmm. I mean, you talk about really good food. We have yeah. James Beard Award winners in this area. Mm-hmm. We have just, I mean. I also think about James on the mill, which is now closed. Big shout out to them. But then you have his pizza restaurant, JM's in which are MJ's, which is really good pizza right there in Springdale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's excellent pizza. It's some of the best, you know, coming from somebody that grew up in the shadows of New York City. It's 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 some of the best pizza that I've had west of the Mississippi. And that's saying something because I've had some good pizzas. That is saying something. I. I think Miles James is a great guy. He let me interview him a lot for the book. And we even had pizza at MJ's when okay. we did that. And he oh, drove good. me around. And then shortly after that, he had to close the restaurant because the MJ's is the next place he's going right with his franchises and a duplicatable franchise, you know? Exactly. And yeah. uh, I think he's, I think he's a wonderful chef. And he was one of the first chefs we had in Northwest Arkansas. When I went away to Maui, the only good restaurants we had in town that I knew about were Fred's Hickory Inn and Miles James's place. Yeah. But now there's a plethora, you know? And you're, you're right. We've got James Beard nominated chefs, Matt McClure. We've got, you know, like you mentioned over at, um, at the Preacher's Son, what wonderful food for people that have celiac or gluten-free needs. Love it. You know, oh, I, th- I think um, Matt Cooper is a magician with what he can do. That fried chicken yeah. is, is on a whole nother yeah. level. Yeah. You've got to. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> who knew? And, you know, <laughs> um, r- and just right in my own backyard, right in Fayetteville, uh, Hannah Withers with Leverett Lounge. They do a really, oh, great, I love they, that they, place. Do re- they have Korean um, fried chicken. They have this uh, fried cauliflower that is out of this world. I mean, I was just there not too long ago. It was actually one of the first restaurants that I went to because I we've been primarily ordering out and we've been kind of using the hashtag save our restaurants by doing a lot of takeout. But we did finally go in and guys. dine in and, and uh, socially distant, of course, but we went with another couple and sure. we went to Leverett Lounge and the food was just, um, ha- Hannah knows what she's doing. The food and the drinks. I mean, it's like a combination yeah. of the two. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, just I agree. Re- really and the environment and atmosphere within within Leverett is great. I usually sit under the big peacock with like <laughs> the tail that comes down to the table, you know. Right. And right, I, right. I remember the first time I was there, I was like, "It's next to a laundromat. What's happening here?" And um, I loved how edgy it was. And I, I, literally, the vegetarian options on the menu. I was like, "I'm just going to order a selection oh. of her sides," and they were all incredible. Oh yeah, yeah. And when speak of vegetarian options, another place I'm going to give a shout out to, and you've probably been there, is the Mockingbird Kitchen. Which is uh, love Chrissy Sanderson. Yeah, She's yes, amazing. And, and she makes these um, uh, these vegan wings with cauliflower, Ooh. the hot wings, but they're cauliflower, and they are out of this world. I mean, just yeah. I'm anyway. I'm getting hungry. I got to stop. So I am I mean, getting <laughs> hungry too. I want her beans, greens, and cornbread recipe that she uh, does. Oh, she does right. this collection of beans and like local Ozark things. Right. And mixes them together in almost a hot salad with the greens kind of withered out. Oh, and that's goodness. usually what I order there. And simple restaurant, chef owned. I love chef owned restaurants and I want to give support to them. Like you said, whether takeout or going in, if you feel comfortable with it, all the restaurants, as far as I am concerned with my food tours, they've been very respectful. For yeah. the COVID guideline. Yeah, I'm, got, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. So you still during your tours right now, even during the pandemic. How's that been going? Been. Well, I would say I had to cancel a bunch because a lot of people at the beginning of the pandemic in March, I mean, I had 25 tours actually, Randy, that I had to cancel, which was kind of sad because I finally got the ball go- going and then COVID happened. But people weren't comfortable at that point going out to eat. Now people are going back into it. And I have a lot of clients that are picking it back up. And it's so easy because... All we do is we'll wear our mask right when we get into the restaurant and we sit down and the food I've already pre-ordered. So it magically arrives within five minutes and the waters are already on the table. At that point, you can take your mask off and everything feels normal. Yeah. You're spaced apart from other diners. But that's actually really good for us because they can hear me better and we can all have our own space. And as long as we usually do 10 or less people, it falls right in line with COVID guidelines and patio weather. A lot of times we'll dine out. It hasn't impaired the tours other than just people's comfortability in dining out. But I think as people realize we have in Northwest Arkansas an ability and even outdoor dining districts like we have now in uh, Springdale, where we can adjust and pivot to the new COVID guidelines and we can still enjoy a nice, a nice meal out like your wife and you have experienced. Oh, absolutely. No, I agree 100%. And I was saying to somebody last night how, you know, even in Arkansas, I think we've done a really good job, even with the governor's guidelines and the health mandates of social distancing, social distancing when we go out and do those kind of things. And I've been to a few other states and I'll I'll just, they'll just remain nameless, but uh, they don't do such a great job of that. And so I definitely feel comfortable going into local restaurants because of the seriousness with which they have taken the precautions and the recommendations and the guidelines. And it's not a, oh, well, I just need to have the freedom to do whatever I want to do. I just want to make right. sure that every patron is safe. And I think that's, if every restaurant tour focuses on that, we'll be fine. Because I think everybody that I've talked to has really made it a concerted effort to support our local restaurants, because I can tell you for a fact, I have friends and family in the New York City area, and they are telling me that restaurants are closing left and right. Restaurants that are never going to open again. And that breaks my heart. It does. It really does. And so I just want to tell people that, you know, we're kind of, I know we're in a little bit of a bubble here in the Ozarks, but I think we're very fortunate about how we're experiencing this and, you know, just, let's just keep toeing the line. And I think as things get better, as we get a vaccine and things start to open up a little bit more, we'll be able to appreciate the efforts that went, went into trying to preserve what we have. So would you agree with that? Absolutely. Oh, I absolutely agree with that. I feel like, like you said, you know, um, we really need to support our local entrepreneurs, which is a lot of our chefs and restaurateurs, because America was built by people that pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. And, you know, in in a way, like this is the American spirit, this entrepreneurial spirit, you know, it, yes, we will probably continue to have big corporations and franchises, but it's these little mom and pop restaurants. Yeah. And these places that are neighborhood establishments, like you're talking about in New York and even here in the Ozarks, that people go to to see their friends, to have a drink, even and the owners always walking around, making sure everybody's taken care of. Those kind of places make America what it is, whether it's a restaurant or a small business. 
we need to be able to support those so that we can keep America in, in a way, the way that it's the way that it's been, that it encourages the middle class, yeah. um, that it celebrates ingenuity and and creativity, and it, it celebrates also the um, you know a business minded spirit that says, "Hey, I can make something with nothing." I right. think that's something that we've always seen, and so that kind of spirit doesn't need to die because of COVID. We just have to adjust. And again, you're right; we have to patronize and step out of our comfort zone and adjust. The way we order and the way we eat. I was just on a podcast the other day with a lady talking about food sustainability as consumers, not just as people in the restaurant side of things. You have to adjust what you expect. You have to yeah. be willing to take a streamlined, smaller menu and not not be upset about it. But go ahead and support the restaurant anyways because they're doing the best they can. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I've worked with a number, I've had a number of local people with restaurants, including people like Jeremy Gothrop and others on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I've just continued to support their efforts and what they're doing because, you know, they, you know, Jeremy has opened up his kitchen for people like, um, Nate Walls from Secondhand Smoke Barbecue to come in and with an organization called Get Shift Done, they have, uh, okay. <laughs> service. Yeah, exactly. You have to, I say it very quickly. I said shift, on right. One, right? <laughs> but but, but uh, they have been able to keep a lot of service workers employed in the area by them working with people like Nate, who is feeding a lot of people wh- that are food insecure here in Northwest Arkansas. And that's a big issue that has yeah. come to light since the pandemic because- oh, yeah. You know, we've been so successful in so many different ways from an economic standpoint. It took the pandemic to scratch the surface for us to realize that a lot of us were just one paycheck away from disaster. And Nate and so many other local chefs have taken it uh, upon themselves to make sure that people are being fed, that additional meals are going out. I, I, it's just, just looking at that type of neighborly support that we've seen from Mm -hmm. the restaurant community goes a long way. So I take every extra dollar that I can to support these guys efforts to go to these restaurants and get takeout. Even if I know I can make lunch at home, sometimes I'll just buy lunch out because I know it makes a big difference. And I'm not suggesting that anybody go out and spend their last dollar, but I certainly, if you have it, spend it and help, help these folks out. Because a lot of them, what you don't see is what they're doing on the back end to not only make a lot of the people that work with them take care, taken care of, but they're also feeding Mm -hmm. people that you know nothing about. So I totally agree. Yeah. And that's one thing that I'm really impressed with, with um, Northwest Arkansas in general. Um, Mm -hmm. Listen, I could go on and on and just talk to you so much about this. So (laughs) so give give the audience the particulars. We're going to put a link to the book in the show notes. But if people want Mm -hmm. to sign up for one of your future tours, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, they can go online to www.ozarkculinarytours.com. Um, okay. Honestly, I take a lot of phone calls too, um, to uh, you know, to myself because a lot of times when I'm booking food tours these days due to COVID, a lot of people want private tours. Sure. So that way, the people that are on the tour they know personally and they feel comfortable, you know, going out with them and being close proximity at the table. So we'll, um, we'll share your number. Personally, Oh, sorry. Go ahead and share the number if you give it out. Yeah, yeah. If, if it's okay with you, it's oh, four seven nine two two zero nine five seven zero. Okay. All right. You heard it there, folks. Four seven nine two two zero nine five seven zero. When you call Chef Aaron, make sure you tell her. Tell her I heard about you on the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast, and I want you to sign me up for a culinary tour. So, and she'll take good good care of you. So that would be great. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And then I guess 
obviously I've got to put you on the spot here and I don't want you to make hard feelings with any of your local chef friends, <laughs> but for people listening to this, if they were coming to the area, let's say they're, they're doing an interview with, I don't know how interviews are being done with Walmart or Tyson or, sure. you know, JB hunt, but believe it or not, people are listening to this podcast as they contemplate taking jobs in Northwest Arkansas. So if they Love do that. have a chance to visit where would you say they need to go to get the best sampling of food that makes this place so special? And I know that's a loaded question, exactly. but but I'm going to just <laughs> I, just give us a sampling of maybe one or two or three places that if I was just coming to Northwest Arkansas to visit that you say you got to check it out. Go to these three places and that will give you a, a good example of what the culinary um, cuisine is like here in the Ozarks. OK, perfect. That would represent tech spec. Yes. Specifically Ozark cuisine, you're saying. Absolutely. Well, so not, just, say, not just not um, just Ozark cuisine, but just good cuisine in general. The current yeah. culture. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. 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 Yeah. So what I would say is I, I, I really have a high respect for Matt McClure at the Hive. Um, okay. Just because he butchers his own animals. Um, he does do Southern takes on Ozark and Ozark cuisine, but he also does variations. I feel like that's one of the better places for me um, that I enjoy eating in Bentonville. Mm -hmm. um, the ladies over at Mockingbird Kitchen in Fayetteville are fantastic. Um, we were talking about them earlier, right. but I really, I really admire what they do um, as far as um, taking Southern cuisine and creating new things, new concepts with it. And it's a chef-owned restaurant. I really respect the fact that um, you're having something that's like locally owned um, going down those roads. I have really enjoyed, um, and this is one that maybe I think that eventually they will reopen, but Sweet uh, Freedom Creamery in the 8th Street Market is owned by a lady named Jessica Kihei, and she does these amazing cheese tastings and wine pairings. And a lot of people don't know that she does that, and you can actually sit in the restaurant and taste them yourself. Um, and she'll do charcuterie boards and, 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 and accoutrements, things like that, that really represent this kind of gourmet edge that we're taking on with the change in the restaurant scenery, it's the kind of place you can walk up to the counter and order a bunch of cheese to take home with you um, and, and different salamis and breads that are that are made by a local baker called Rock and Baker who employs uh, people that have special needs and teaches them a skill on how to bake. Wow. And so it, it, it's a way to kind of keep giving back to the community in so many different ways. But I love doing a cheese tasting there. And I would say, um, yeah, those are some of my, those are probably some of my favorite Favorite places. I also agree with you on Leverett Lounge. It's fantastic. That, <laughs> I would have mentioned that if we hadn't already spoken of it. I, I really admire what she's doing. That's innovative. Yeah, it reminds yeah. me of Alice Waters from right. um, Shape Paul. Shape and Eat. Yeah. Yeah. Shape and yeah. Yes. 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 And, uh, because it's very almost like kind of has a California feel, but it's vegetarian and organic and and unusual, and it's very Fayetteville, yeah, right? It's absolutely, it is. And it Fayetteville is. has its own unique culture, as does Bentonville. And so I think each restaurant that I've mentioned sort of represents a little bit more of that culture of each town that is collectively Northwest Arkansas. And I love that. You're right, be because um, each city has its own flavor, like Bentonville, yeah. Rogers. So they're they're all unique. They are they have the, all have their own DNA. But then there is that collective yeah. DNA that makes up the Ozarks and they're all a part of that. Mm -hmm. So they almost have this duality of existence. Right. And so I, I, I'm glad That's you mentioned right. that because yeah. I think people need to understand that you come here, you're coming to the sandwich and the bread is Fayetteville and Bentonville and Rogers mm -hmm. and Springdale are the tomatoes and lettuce and all the other goodness in between. It makes right? up Northwest Arkansas. So it does. You're yeah. absolutely correct. We're yeah. very much a mixing bowl of, of people whenever people say well which town do you live in in northwest arkansas i say i'm in bella vista but i travel all the time for work and i'm always going around for me we're all one big happy family yeah. and the town we the only they're, they're only separated like they're almost like pearls on a strand but i feel right. like northwest arkansas just flows over the ozark mountains when i think of it i think of not individual towns but just this collective mentality and i feel like we're getting to that even more so maybe even as a blessing of covid yeah. to learn to help each other and live collectively. I see chefs supporting each other. I'm on a Facebook group called NWA COVID-19 Chefs Collaborative. So wow. when I have a gig that I can't take, I can refer it to other chefs and let them pick it up. I remember when I did some work with Dan Nunnally of Nunnally Chevrolet, you talk about 
people doing good things. Gam decided he wanted to support essential workers and at the same time support restaurants and chefs. So he asked me to compile a list of restaurants and chefs that were doing amazing food that would do takeout or carry out. He bought the food himself, delivered it in one of his cars from the lot to people at daycares and firemen and nurses who were doing essential work during COVID. And then that was celebrated with his own money just as a volunteer thing. Northwest Arkansas to whole workers, you know? Yeah. Now, I, where the candy comes I love that. I, I think that's a great story. And, you know, Dan is not alone in, you know, being a successful entrepreneur in this area that has really taken it upon himself to, mm-hmm. um, to spread the love, if you will. So yeah, it was, it was spreading yeah. the love yeah. <laughs> in a so, really sweet truck. <laughs> right, exactly. There you, go. there you go. I love that. So, all right, well, cool. So we've gotten how everybody can get in touch with you. They can visit www.ozark culinary tours.com and that's tours with an s make sure that you tell that's, chef yeah. aaron that um you heard about her right here on i am northwest arkansas and then the cell is 479-220-9570 give her a call if you have any questions uh you can check out the website certainly want to encourage you to get the book you can get it on her website it's also available on amazon.com so I want to encourage you to um, support her in any way that you can. And whether it's reading the book uh, and maybe once you get the book, then you go on one of her culinary tours. And if you're not from this area and you come down here, you need to see about scheduling something in advance so that you can be part of one of her tours. Cause I'm pretty sure she will send you over the edge with your decision-making about moving to the Ozark. So is that a deal? That's the deal, Randy. That sounds great. <laughs> and I also forgot to mention I'm on Instagram and Facebook under the same name. Yeah, we'll put but all yeah, of that. I, I think it's a great way to meet, to get acquainted with you. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, for absolutely. Sure. <laughs> yeah. We'll put we'll put it all in the show yeah. notes so that everybody has that. And uh Chef Aaron, thank you so much for just taking time out of your busy schedule and uh meeting with our people here on the podcast. We really appreciate it. We want to in- continue to encourage everything that you're doing here in Northwest Arkansas. And we look forward to connecting with you again to tell the next chapter of this story. So keep up the great work. Thank you, Randy. And keep up the great work yourself. It's a real honor to be on your show. And thank you so much for supporting all of us here in Northwest Arkansas that are trying to make it great. Absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Well, there you have it, folks. Another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I hope you liked um, Chef Aaron Rowe and what she had to share. I, I don't know about you guys, but I am really hungry right now. And uh, I'm, I'm going to do two things today. One is I know it's Amazon Prime Day, the day that we're recording this. So I'm going to go order her book. And I'm going to figure out how soon um, in the near future I can schedule a culinary tour uh, and take advantage of some of the things that I'm already aware of. But but I think that she could probably teach me a few more things to learn about the food scene here in Northwest Arkansas. So I really want to encourage you to uh, support her in any way that you can. And um, Again, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen to um, everything that she's doing and everything that's happening here in the Ozarks. As always, you can find our show wherever great podcasts can be found. And uh, we would uh, encourage you to uh, write a review if you can. Let us know what you think about the podcast. If you know someone that you think would be a good fit to come on the show in the future, we would encourage you to do that. And uh, we would just um, love to have you participate and anything that we're doing here in Northwest Arkansas. So uh, that's all that we have for this week. As you know, our podcast comes out every week. Um, and, you know, there's so much that you can learn about what we're doing. And we really just want to encourage you to uh, download this podcast, share it with a friend. And uh, certainly we, we wouldn't be remiss if we didn't uh, give a shout out 
to uh, all of our sponsors for the podcast. The Exclusive Real Estate Group with Chris Dinwiddie does an amazing job here locally. You can give Chris a call at 479-305-0468. You can also check him out at the Exclusive Real Estate Group online and also his information's in our show notes. And then finally, for those of you out there that are trying to build your perfect business, you should check out Next Level 7. I've worked with these guys for a couple of years now, and Brian Clark, who is the founder of Next Level 7, has built not one, but two eight-figure businesses from scratch and sold them. So we actually use Brian's training here at I Am Northwest Arkansas, and it has truly transformed how we do business. You can get a copy of his free course today. The link is in the show notes, and uh, I would encourage you to check it out. Doesn't cost you a dime, and uh, I think Brian could could help a lot of people with their business, kind of take it to another level. So I encourage you to check out Next Level Seven when you have a chance. All of this can be found online at I am NorthwestArkansas.com. Listen, we appreciate you guys, and uh, that's all we have for this week. We will see you next week. Peace. hope you enjoyed this episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. Check us out each and every week, available anywhere that great podcasts can be found. For show notes or more information on becoming a guest, visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. We'll see you next week on I Am Northwest Arkansas.